It was like the South Park kids reenacting the aristocrats joke. As a kid, I loved things that most others did. I was in the slot car racing, radio control cars, uh, low shooting bows and arrows, uh, you know, air gun at cans, uh, fishing, go-karts, and you know, watching racing. I don't know how old I was, it's probably around the 10 years old, I got an amazing thing. It was a five horse Briggs and Stratton powered go-kart. Loved it, it was the best thing in the world. I can still like feel and smell and practically taste this thing. And it meant so much to me, and I never could have known at the time, but I figured out that that five horse Briggs and Stratton engine on my go-kart was the same as what, you know, little junior dragsters were. So I could go to, like, get my grandfather to take me to Jags, and I'd start learning about car engines from reading their catalog. And I, like, get a can and air filter, put on my go-kart, and I was so excited. And I grew up out in the country, and my parents had this little golf course. It's not Pebble Beach. My dad worked 120 hours a week. I'm pretty sure he made less than a teacher when you figure out the hours. Sometimes I actually got to drive it out there. And I remember wonderful memories, like I saw a flock of geese, right? And I love animals. So I'm like, oh, this is gonna be interesting. I wanna see them fly. So I drove up to them and they, uh, of course they took off. And I'm like, this is gonna be so exciting. And I drove right underneath them. And there's these geese flying right above me. You can hear them hawk and their wings kind of clicking. Except as a kid, I wasn't smart enough to realize what do birds do when they take off? They drop some ballast. Well, now I'm dodging poop, goose poop, left, right, oh crap. It was madness, but like these were the beautiful memories. Like it's like autocross, that's nothing. Try dodging goose poop, right? Being on a golf course, I saw millions of golf balls flying through the air my whole life. I could plan trajectories and see this and hear the spin on it. It was nuts. And uh, when you want to up the ante with go-karts, you, you want to do tricks, right? So instead of just shooting uh, cans with an air gun, well, why not do it at a power slide in a go-kart? We're like, whoosh, boom, you know, like this. That makes it more interesting. So but with the golf balls, the most fun thing to do was ride full speed on the driving range while people are hitting golf balls. And actually <laughs> like three wood, five iron, six iron, pitching wedge, boom, like this, and you'd try to time it so that the golf ball is coming and the moment it strikes the ground, you could go to full understeer like this and click a ball off like this, or like, you know, get a rear end to come out and hit it with the rear tire. I actually got pretty good at it. What must this have looked like? This is go-kart, and this kid just like, in a driving range with golf balls getting hit, golf balls flying this way and that way. I'm thinking there's gotta be like an old farmer going, man, that pooch boy ain't right. <laughs> so this is what I grew up with. So, you know, when high school came along, that's gonna be a magic time because I'm about to drive, right? First car. So, high school sucks for everybody, I'm pretty sure. I mean, <laughs> freshman year, I remember getting a left hook and not completely out and in uh, third period German class. And of course, well, I got to take the next period off. <laughs> and then so like after that, swollen bloody face. And then so, you know, the kids that were a little more advanced with like physics and science, uh, we got the great pleasure of having to leave the high school and, you know, during lunch go to what used to be the post office to like the advanced, which was a gauntlet of like every dropout street person that just wanted to jack with the little geeks. You know what I mean? The whole time, the only thing to eat was gas station food. And my hometown had like some kind of mental center for people who weren't playing with a full deck and these people would roam the streets. So there were like cowboys and you know, a guy looks like Jesus walking around. This was normal. I remember vividly in English class, like this kid, he's taking apart a shotgun shell right here and he's like, got scissors and banging on the primer cap, pointing at me right here. I'm like, you know, and I'm thinking, this, this is my advanced education here. I'm thinking physics right now. So are the BBs in it heavier than the shell? So if the primer goes off, who's gonna get hurt more, me or him? Where's the inertia? And I'm like, man, how does they not see this? The teacher, you know, he's got it apart. There's BBs, there's powder. This was the 90s. The internet wasn't a thing yet. We didn't have cell phones. It was, it was just madness. It was like, the South Park kids reenacting the aristocrats joke. That was high school. And uh, I wore this jacket out, and in a small town in Ohio, it was an old Michael Schumacher Benetton World Champion jacket. And it's faded because I wore it every single day. And I thought about it afterward, and I looked like a dork. You know, everybody made fun. Nobody knew what Formula One was in Ohio back then. And it was just a memory of there are better things out there. There, there must be to get through this hell. I almost get a car. So I, I survived that at part of high school and I, I get a car, right? 
1987 Volkswagen Golf. Navy blue A2 chassis. Now, it wasn't a GTI. I wasn't that cool. It was a four-door. It was stick. Wide ratio. Okay, 1.8 liter. Bosch k -Jet Tronic. And I loved it. It was my car. Did kind of like a silver stripe on the side, sort of like Starsky and Hutch, even though I wasn't a Starsky and Hutch, but that's what it looked like. And so from being the dork, you know, that was into go-karts, I became the dork that was into European cars. But there was no Fast and the Furious back then. There were no tuners. None of that. I was the dork that had the dorky Volkswagen. In the small town, we're like, boy, you need a Chevy. What kind of bowl is that? <laughs> you know, it's like, and it was just, it was an onslaught. But I'd come to school and uh, I'd be drawing cars and reading the Demon Tweaks catalog. And I'd be like, hmm, the model in the Demon Tweaks catalog is pretty good looking, you know, and New Speed and Tectonics. And, my dad and I autocross, which is really great. We had a 1982 Volkswagen Scirocco that he got. It was uh, an X beat up IT SCCA car. Um, and we did that together. So it kind of went from, you know, the Schumacher Jack, there's something better in this world. <laughs> like I can be into cars and be smart there and deal with the onslaught of just horror <laughs> of high school. And I remember once being in English class and it was vocabulary. And I remember they'd, they'd like give words and see if anybody knew the definition. And he's like, the word is canard. Does anybody know the definition of that? I'm like, I do. And I'm like, well, it's a small wing on the front of a vehicle, such as an airplane or car, that controls pitch. And everybody looks at me like there's rats pouring out of my ears. And he's like, um, does anyone else have another definition? And this girl's like, um, Mr. T, it is an unfounded story or rumor. He's like, um, yeah, we're going to go with that. And I remember everybody immediately uproarious laughter that I dared thought a canard was some sort of engineering term. And I'm just like, canard, you know, like the front of a long easy, Burt Rutan, Voyager, circumnavigated the globe, unrefueled, or like the black carbon fiber dive planes on the front of my Viper that I'm gonna use when I drive and move out of this horrible town. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, is this the moment when they create James Bond supervillains? Like the smart kid gets laughed at because nobody, anyway. The one saving grace was art class um, because, forget the grade, there was no ceiling. You could do projects and I could actually design cars and stuff like that. But I think car guys will get that because it was the cars, it was the love, it was the belief that there's something better out there that helped get us through that. And we could uh, put our you know, intelligence on it. I think you can also see what kind of started leading to Genius Garage one day, giving people a shot. So I somehow survived high school and got out. And you know, I still lived in Tiffin, and I had a buddy that had an airplane, an experimental airplane, goofiest thing in the world. I remember flying it once and just like pancaked the landing gear, and it popped off like that, and we spun off the runway, and we got out, and he's just all distraught. I'm like, you want me to go get your wheel? <laughs> you know, it was that kind of airplane. And uh, one day at the golf course, I had a radio control Spitfire, and uh, it was all ready to go, it was electric, it was charged up, and I saw him flying over, I'm like, oh, I'm getting my Spitfire. And I launch that thing and I'm like, come on, man, get over here. Let's do this. And he sees it. He plays along. We start flying formation over the same driving range I did as a kid in a go-kart, right? And I'm thinking, that same farmer's probably out there going, that pooch boy ain't right. <laughs> and like this. But uh, so we're flying this and he, he, you know, having a lot of fun. And he calls me one day. He goes, Casey, you're really good with cars, right? Um, I need to adjust the ignition tuning and the fuel mapping on my airplane. Do you want to go fly it tonight? I'm like, yeah, let's go do it. So we get in this thing, it's, it's cold, it's winter, it's pitch black. I don't, I don't even think there was a moon really that night. So to tune it, you know, you fly it at full throttle. And we're tuning it for a long time. We're not paying attention to like where we are, or altitude, and doing VFR. He's pilot in command, so I don't have to think of these things. We're tuning this thing, we end up like, I don't know, 10,000 foot altitude in this tiny experimental amphibious tail dragger plane with a bubble cockpit. And I'm sitting right next to him and I'm like, we got a long way to go back. And I got to pee like a racehorse. This is bad. And I'm holding it. I'm like, hey, man. And I leaned over to tell him, like, I got to pee. And I hit the trim tab and nose the thing like straight down. I'm like, oh, I'm going to die and I have to pee. Dude, I don't know if I can hold it all the way back. And he's like, oh, well, you know, it's an amphibious plane. Just pee on the floor. We can, I got a bilge pump. We can bilge it out. Like, you know, if we got water from a water landing. And I'm like, really? You can do that? And I'm like, he's sitting right here. I'm like, I don't think we're at the point in our relationship where I feel comfortable to just whip it out and pee on the floor of his airplane while he's sitting right there. Plus, that's just unpleasant. I'm like, I just can't deal with this. What are we going to do? And I go, wait, can we fly over my high school? So I realized a valuable lesson at that time that success is getting through the horror and that one day that you could, in fact, use a private personal aircraft to urinate on your high school, but you have the good taste and integrity not to. I did hold it all the way.